let's start with roll call. Um, Commissioner Conway, that is me, I am here. Commissioner Linsky. Yes, present. Hi. Commissioner yes. Parsons. Yes, I'm here. And I believe I heard this already, but Commissioner Stackhouse. Yeah, I believe he's out of town. Uh, Commissioner Kerr. Also not available. Commissioner Martin. All right, and last we'll round it out with Commissioner Rowden. Present. Hi, welcome. Thank you. All right, uh, next on our agenda is, as always, to approve the minutes from the last meeting, a meeting that I was not in uh, attendance for. Uh, thank you for carrying on without me. Uh, we we're planning the fair around that time. Um, so do I have, have we all had an opportunity to review the August 15th minutes uh, that were sent out sometime uh, about a week ago or so? Yes. And if so, do I hear a motion to approve them? Then second. It sounds like we had a motion to approve the minutes by Commissioner Parsons and a second um, by I think Commissioner Linsky. Uh, all those yes. in favor say aye. 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 All right. Those meeting notes, uh, minute, meeting minutes have been approved. Uh, next is the public participation part of the agenda. And as a reminder, this part of the meeting is for items that are not on the agenda. We cannot act on items presented during this part of the agenda. Um, we are prohibited by the open meeting law from discussing or even considering the items until such a time that the item is officially placed on an agenda. Uh, we do have a five minute limit to any comments in this public participation part of our meeting. Do we have anybody from the public that would like to participate? And I can't see the room very well, so uh, somebody would have to let me know if uh, if there is somebody from that room. I think we're good. Okay. Meaning we don't have anyone in the room. Super. And anybody on uh, on this here teams uh, that wants to speak to something? I know we have a, at least one guest, but it might be on something related related down the line. That's our first agenda item. Well, then let's get into it, y'all. What are we doing? All right, uh, first item: community running track discussion uh, conversation with Sean Anthony. Commissioners, yeah, so we are joined by Sean Anthony and Vince Sherry is also here. Um, thank you both for joining us today. And they are back here at the request of the commission. Um, so there were several commissioners that had questions specifically for Sean related to the community running track. So I would open it up. Um, I believe Commissioner Linsky and also Commissioner Martin have questions for Sean directly. Um, just to bring everyone up to speed, we had a presentation at our last meeting for a request from Vince and Sean to consider a community running track. And um, there were some questions about uh, elite athletes and perhaps Olympians that might want to use or not use or have access to a public track, those kinds of things. So Sean is here um, and so is Vince here in the room. I would just open it up to those commissioners um, to, to proceed with your follow-up questions, please. Uh, I don't think Commissioner Martin is here, um, but I can, uh, this is Commissioner Linsky, I can just say, first of all, that my my biggest reason for asking for Mr. Anthony to attend was because it seemed like at the last meeting there were some references to partnerships or funding um, to help out with this track, but Mr. Sherry didn't have the information on that. He said that Mr. Anthony was the money man, Mr. Anthony was the idea man, so I was just asking that if that were the case that we hear from Mr. Anthony about the proposals for this running track. 
Well, thank you. Uh, with all due respect to Vince, uh, I would not consider myself to be the money man, <laughs> but I can I can answer questions as to the elite athlete usage of the track and what that would mean for the larger Olympic sport community. Um, I do know, I do know that there would be a little chance of getting money out of USA Track and Field directly. USA Track and Field is the national governing body for track and field in our country. Um, they might be in a position where they would not contribute hard dollars to such an effort, but could potentially do something like cover the cost of, they have, they have a gentleman who's, uh, I think he's actually, he's been with USA Track and Field longer than any employee they have, who does a lot of things with respect to uh, surveying, planning, designing of tracks. And uh, I have discussed with USA Track and Field the potential for that gentleman and his team to come out and do all of that, and USA Track and Field would cover the cost of it. Um, but there is a distinction to be made between USA Track and Field as the national governing body for track and field and the USA Track and Field Foundation. And from what I understand, uh, there's probably a greater possibility of getting the USATF Foundation involved. Uh, it would be a new thing for them. They typically give grants directly to athletes, but they have an awful lot of money and they may very well be able to incentivize, be incentivized to contribute some major hard dollars in an effort to have an impact on a lot of uh, Team USA athletes. Maybe we can rehash this discussion, especially since uh, Michigan probably wasn't the last one when we initially discussed it. I think we were talking about a six-lane uh, running track, 100 meter, uh, the Cheshire Park, where we closed the artificial multi-purpose food. So um, how many runners did you anticipate using that program? How many do you run with them for weekly running tournaments or track meets as well? Yeah, it would be a non-competition track. So we wouldn't have any track meets there. Um, and I think by design, that probably makes the most sense because 7,000 people is not a good design place to race. And any, any, any athletes that are going to come here race to race are typically affiliated. You're getting comments that it's hard to hear, so you guys can speak up. Great. Sure. Um, so it would be, it would be training base. Um, and, just, and just to clarify, we want to clarify this piece. Um, Sean, I'm sorry. I, I don't believe I, I called you the money man. Um, <laughs> Okay. I don't think I said that. Uh, I, I think in terms of funding, we'll, we'll, what I propose uh, is, is crowdfunding. So I think there will be a lot of community involvement. I also think that various vendors would be interested um, through potentially our relationships, both both with um, various brands that, that we work with through the shop, um, as well as teams that come and visit, potentially having brands backing them. So I think between the local community as well as um, the visiting community, we could, we could do pretty well on the crowdfunding platform and, and do well in terms of raising the funds. So that's not completely the point, yet, but I do think we could do that. I, did, I didn't actually, in terms of grant funding, yes, that, that would be more Sean's wheelhouse um, in terms of having accessible something. Um, if we were in the but yeah, the, the proposal was for a training facility, uh, and that is what we are lacking in town right now. We're lacking training, easily accessible training facilities. Team Run Flex App, which is the club that I'm involved with, uh, has 400 paying members uh, annually, and there's a little bit of rotation there. But, and this is something I mentioned last time, that is a sliver of the potential, primarily because Team Run Flex App only takes place Tuesday night at 6 p.m. So if you think about the entire bike staff population, the whole potential, who is available to run a track workout? I mean, I love to ask this group to do okay, We have something that would be really desirable for you to do. Are you available at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday night to do it? I think most people would probably say no. Um, so it's an inherently bad time. The, the accessibility um, beyond, or the uh, desire for accessibility beyond that group is exponential. What would be the idea? I think the ideal situation have an open facility. Yeah, yeah. Not to hold an organized practice, but just to have the ability to just go and, and use it. That's that's the idea. What other facilities? 
What other facilities do we need to support that? I mean, as far as like parking or bus, uh, bus operations, those need to be incorporated in the site. Uh, parking and restroom would be ideal. Which I think to answer that, we would plan for anyway some sort of parking, definitely, possibly restroom with the expansion of that park, even with just the artificial fee. Commissioner Linsky, can I answer your questions for Sean? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing about every third or fourth word, so um, it's difficult to follow along with actual answers, but um, uh, is, is Commissioner Ryan uh, with us now to uh, follow up? Maybe he can hear a little bit better. Yeah, so he's on chat only, and his question is, what funding is available to help as similar to a public-private partnership? What has changed in relationship with NAU that track is having difficulty using their facility? And with issues arising years ago, why approach the city now? So I guess that's three questions. <laughs> um, and why don't we have Sean try to answer first and then Vince? And we'll start with the first question of what funding is available? to help as similar to a public-private partnership? Well, as I said, um, I don't think there's any money directly out of USA Track and Field. However, I do think there are possibilities with the USA Track and Field Foundation. Vince has talked, to, um, uh, talked about the subject of crowdfunding, which I also believe has a lot of potential. And I don't think it's out of the realm of reasonability that many of the large, um, well-funded international governing bodies that send their athletes here on a regular basis. Um, and here we're talking about Norway, we're talking about Germany, we're talking about the Netherlands, Japan, um, Canada. It's, it's not outside uh, that realm of reasonability to think that they may have an interest in providing some assistive funding for a track that would guarantee uh, consistently guarantee the availability for their athletes. Um, altitude training as a performance enhancement intervention is so popular now that in many sports, like running, if you're not using it in some form or fashion, you're just not competitive at the elite level. And so we've seen over the years a continual large increase year over year of elite distance runners coming here. And to get into that second question um, about why haven't we done anything about it before, I can only speak from my perspective, of course, and it's really, really a matter of we, us priding ourselves on our community partnerships in really working to leverage what we already have present that make this such a great place to train rather than seek redundancies in existing resources. You know, our company grew out of the Center for High Altitude Training at NAU, and we've always tried to be um, respectful toward our roots and trying to maintain a close partnership with NAU. Our teams swim in the pool there, they do strength work in the gyms, they run on the track, they eat in the cafeterias, uh, they use the on-campus medical clinic, and really for us having a centralized sport campus, if you will, really helps us to market Flagstaff as a great place to train. Unfortunately, the university over time appears to care less and less about this sort of business. You know, despite it being an opportunity to forge um, ties with the most prestigious sporting event on the planet. And we have really seen access being chipped away at over the years, um, despite monumental efforts to, you know, to work with the university, we've really been unable to incentivize them to put into place a track management system that allows us to systematically and dependably book and pay for space on the track. And, Dependability is really the issue, and that's what's evolved over the years. There's nothing worse for an elite runner to plan a track workout and come to the facility for training only to find that's not available, or and or 
be in the middle of a track workout at a facility only to be kicked off by facility managers because it's dedicated for some of their usage. You know, and from our point of view, it's also not great to jump through all the hoops to officially secure and pay for space on any track for a team, only to find all sorts of other groups out there during our time who haven't gone through official channels, who have not paid anything, and there's no policing going on and to manage their usage. So it's really become, as the Canadians would say, a gong show out on the NEU track. It's just continued to be a situation that has deteriorated year over year. And it's unfortunate because that deterioration has taken place when we're seeing larger and larger influxes of distance athletes coming here to train. Thank you, Sean. Vince, would you like to add to that? I think we'll pull you in. Yeah, um, in terms of accessibility, uh, it's interesting because Sean's angle is not the same as my angle. So Sean's angle is obviously working with the visiting athletes and the elite athletes in the community and getting them access to facilities. My angle is getting your average community member access to facilities. That's what we do. Those are our customers. Those are the people we work with and we lobby for. And my experience is exactly the same. So um, indoor track access at NAU is a regular annual need for us. We, we use that facility you know, from January to April every year outdoor access would be preferable there as well consistency for the purpose of consistency for the indoor track we don't have a choice so we kind of go through it but even getting a response uh, from the facilities manager just a simple response you know we are paying for that access we are paying for the time uh, it's so difficult just to get a confirmation it, it's just email after email after email and it's one hour I mean, it's just one hour a week and we do it every single year at the same exact time and every single year it gets harder to access and oftentimes our window of time is shortened for various reasons. Uh, robotics convention, uh, football season is starting early because weather is not you know, amicable for the team. Um, it, it's, it's all sorts of reasons that we're putting the turf down. Right? It, it's endless. Um, the outdoor facility, we've very much been met with the same sorts of things. So we fall back on FUSD, um, but I mentioned to you guys last time, I mean, FUSD's facilities usage abruptly went from about $140 a month to about $680 a month in one month. Like that was over. I was just notified. Um, it's gone from, you know, 100 and change to 600. Um, and, and we've worked with the facilities manager who's big advocate for the program to get those sources back down uh, or get the get the the funds back down. But that's that's really having an advocate who happens to be a facilities manager who is also a runner just really working to help us jump through the hoops. Um, to get that done because he's he's a member of the club and he's interested in seeing it continue. If we lose the relationship with them, it's these these things and and again, that's coming as a local business owner with a template in place with relationships for one Tuesday night a week. If you're just a community member in this town who just wants to run on the track, forget. It. I mean, and, and that is in you know quote one of the running records. Not in the U.S., but in the world. So, so that's kind of where we stand. Access is really difficult, I mean, and for good reason. I mean, the schools are beefing up security for good reason. That's not going to be dialed back. Uh, they, they don't want outsiders on their facilities at any times. Um, and, and, and again, for good reason. But, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing issue. Uh, the reason I didn't bring it up sooner specifically to answer that question is because I was, uh, I guess similarly to Sean, I was just optimistic. I just thought it would turn around. I mean, we have four tracks. You would think sooner or later something would work out. It's been in the newspaper. It's people have covered it. You know, it's 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 a big deal. Um, and throughout the years, there have been times where we get the right person in the right place and it goes pretty good. For them, and then it doesn't, you know, so um, it's, I think, I think along with what Sean said, it's just kind of easy to see at this stage that, this is kind of the status quo. This is what this will be now. It's it's not it's not going to improve. We have the facilities we have as it stands, and getting access to them is is not going to get vastly you know, significantly easier in the coming years. I think the only question, actually, Commissioner Martin, I think that answers your first set of questions. Um. There's one more comment, and hopefully, I brought up the chat in the room, so hopefully, you can see that now. Um, 
Thank you for answering my questions. I really appreciate your time here today. If the city did build the track without all of the other facilities you mentioned, how will this improve Flagstaff's position for this type of business? And again, why don't we start with Sean and then come over to Vince. Yeah, I'm sorry, Rebecca. I'm having a hard time hearing. Could you repeat the question for me, please? Amy's gonna repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. I'm not going to be able to repeat that entire three sentences. <laughs> I really appreciate your time. If the city did build the track, how will it improve Flagstaff's position for this type of business? Uh, well, speaking from the elite athlete perspective, you know, when athletes are coming to altitude to train, there's really only a handful of places where most of these athletes train, and Flagstaff has garnered a reputation as being one of the best places to train, but that reputation, I think, is in danger. I think there are more and more athletes that come here, but have worse and worse experiences being here. And part of it is there's a there's a sport culture that they're drawn to. You know, we provide comprehensive support services for these types of athletes here. We're at an appropriate elevation. You know, we've got pretty good infrastructure here for a lot of the things that they need to do. But I think we're in danger of kind of losing that status as one of the greatest places in the world for distance runners to train at. And I think kind of their business here falls into what I guess economic vitality division would characterize as sustainable tourism. You know, these are fairly large numbers of athletes that trickle in over the course of any given year and have an outsized impact economically on our community without clogging up our roadways and clogging up our restaurants and you know, things that, you know, that everyone in Flagstaff basically complains about. You know, they actually have a pretty small footprint here while contributing a lot economically to our community. You know, there are cities like San Moritz, which is another popular place for altitude training, where the city runs their facilities there and basically uses all of that elite activity, elite athlete activity, to market the city to other types of user groups. And they've garnered an international reputation, you know, for the athletes that they uh, regularly host there. They've made it part of the culture of how they promote the city of San Moritz. I'd be happy to share with the commission how they go about doing that. And, you know, they have a dedicated website and they have a city program. And it's just really, really interesting how they've embraced that activity because they see the positive economic impact to their community there. Like yeah, um, again, speaking to the local level and just the number of, of people that participate in this sport in town, um, I, I think I think that the reputation of this town as a running town on an international and national level, you know, has a tendency to also rub off on a local level. And, and this year, um, the store has a couple programs that we're, we're actually sending a master's team two national championships this Saturday. So we have two master's teams, men's and men's and women's master's team. Um, everybody's 40 years of age and older and they're going to compete in the national 5K championships in Boulder. And those are all locals. Those are all people that have full-time jobs here, children in town, you know, um, and, and work alongside but also happen to run and compete. And some of them moved here for this sport in the onset and stayed, several of them, myself included actually. Um, and it's kind of an interesting thing, you know, there are people that move here for this specific lifestyle and then continue to stay in town as coaches, teachers, lawyers, doctors, business owners, um, and stay here permanently because this is part of the culture. This is something that we enjoy doing, and this is a far better place to do it. In my case, you know, than was Charlotte, North Carolina, Rochester, New York, which were the two places I lived prior to now. So it's it, it seems to me that it's it's something that we are already known for. It's something that people come here for. It's interesting, you know, Sean mentioned St. Moritz. I mean, that was true when I was in college 20 some years ago. Um, we knew of that, an altitude training destination. I knew of St. Moritz before I knew of Flagstaff, which is insane. You think I, I just lived in, at that time in North Carolina. It's not nearly as far away. Um, but Flagstaff garnered that reputation because it's so naturally good for it anyway, that it didn't take an insurmountable effort to make it. It was sort of default, it's built in. Um, 
So I think that this would be an easy step to keep that going, to, to put a little effort into it without having, you know, to go over the top and above and beyond and need to continue to grow. But it does have a vast impact even on the local residents that live here day in and day out of, of all ages, actually. Right, a couple more questions here from Commissioner Martin. Um, this is for me. Uh, do you think your department could be able to build an agreement with the local community organizations to create a public-private partnership? And is it also feasible to have one with NAU included as well? Um, I'll be honest, Commissioner Martin, we've, we've reached out to NAU on several occasions and they have their priorities and we have ours. Um, I, there's no judgment there. It just it is what it is, and I think our local organizations are feeling the same thing as you're hearing here. Um, and then his last question: If the relationship, but in terms of answering your question about public-private partnerships, I think that's our future in Parks and Rec. Um, I don't see us being successful getting on many ballot initiatives for large amounts of funding coming up. And I think this is going to have to be our major plan for funding large projects is public private partnerships moving forward. Um, your last question, Commissioner Martin. And then I think we'll probably want to wrap this up, Chair. Um, if the relationship with access with NAU is diminished, meaning the rest of the facilities access at NAU is limited. How would a track alone be enough to make this business desirable to remain and grow in Flagstaff? Sean, do you want to try that answer? Yeah, again, can, can you repeat a question for me? Um, with limited access to NAU, yeah. the rest of the facilities as well, how would a track alone be enough to make the business desirable for Flagstaff? Well, I should point out that we're, our access to NAU in other realms is not really being limited. Um, and part of that is financial. You know, we're, for example, we do a lot with international swim teams as well, national governing bodies from other countries that send their elite swim teams here. And they have a profound economic impact on the pool. I believe we're the largest single revenue source for the Wall Aquatic Center and the NEU campus. The, the, the finances involved in pool access versus the finances involved in track access are two very, very different things. And the finances are just not able to be at the level that NEU feels incentivized to really do anything about track access. But I don't our access to all those other things at NAU are not going to be diminished in the near future. It really is track access that is the issue for us. But I think it's a it's an outsized problem in that we're in discussions with the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee to restore what's called a US Olympic training site designation. And in particular, that designation centers around the sport of distance running. It's a designation that we carried here before at the university from 2005 to 2008 when the university got rid of the Center for High Altitude Training. And that is a very prestigious um, designation. You know, there's only there's only nine sites in the entire country that have the capability to leverage the use of the Olympic marks, the five ring symbol, um, the words Olympic and Olympiad and, and all that that accompanies the designation. The number one thing that places our discussions in jeopardy with the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee is that you know, they really require structured, uh, dependable, high quality access to training venues. And this is by no means a given in our community at this point in time. It's it's become a real challenge to kind of try to go after that designation because it's uh, so prestigious and so high profile for our community. And yet the linchpin of that is having access to a track. It's dependable, consistent, reasonable access to a track facility and that's a really difficult case for us to make with the way that things are presently no i think that sums it up well 
I hope that answers the question of the commissioner. It looks like it, unless Commissioner Linsky, did you have any follow up? No, I don't. Uh, Mr. Anthony's report was very concise. Thank you. Martin's got a comment there at the end. So, um, yeah, Commissioner Martin is just saying thank you for your time and bearing with my questions. The question now is what direction would we like to take this as a commission? And um, I'll turn it back to the chair to see how you'd like to manage that conversation. Thank you. Um, you know, if I could throw out just one, I have a couple questions, but I'll just save it to one. And so what amount of time would you guys be utilizing a track work to be built for run flag stuff? You talk about, you know, one night on Tuesday, 6 p.m. is not enough. So like if this is part community, part using for a, a organization such as yourselves, what do you think that that breakdown would be? How much of this is available to the public at those non, you know, eight to five times when everybody's at work or at school? Uh, is this going to be a situation where, yeah, it's open to the public when you can squeeze yourself in there outside of all uh, when it's always booked? Well, for elite, for elite athletes, their usage is typically, say, nine to noon in the morning. That'd be the most typical time the athletes would be out here, which obviously is not going to be a time when the vast majority of community members are going to be able to be out there on a weekly basis. So it's a pretty, pretty small but important window. And would that be like a five day a week, seven day a week, roughly? I mean, just kind of an approximate number. Well, for example, when we have Athletics Canada, which is the national governing body for track and field in Canada, when we have that group here, it's typically two days a week they're using the track in within that three hour window, a Tuesday, Thursday, a Monday, Thursday, you know, something like that. And then they tend to go down in elevation to do a lower elevation workout at either Sedona or Cottonwood. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes, um, of course. So in terms of you know my thoughts of, of moving forward, and, and it was something I saw in the notes as well. You know, we do get approached by many organizations all looking for support in, in various ways. Um, we do are currently working on uh, fi finishing up our prioritization um, of projects. Uh, I think we would need to discuss this as a commission and determine if this is something we want to um, see if it's into pri existing priorities. Um, perhaps it's it's working with uh, helping maybe some of those. We also have relationships uh, through with NAU, with FUSD. Maybe there's something we can do to help that um, process along. I also have felt the sting from FUSD for we used to rent a culinary classroom at Sanawa and they priced that one out. So now we don't we care about the classroom at, uh, at Sanawa. So I, I felt that too on a, as a professional. And so um, you know, many other, if we're all kind of feeling that perhaps we can uh, work together to address that with the school district. Um, those are my initial thoughts is that we do have a list of priorities that we're trying to work through currently that we do have many organizations uh, also approaching us to for support on building either a facility or letting programmatic support. Um, and we just have to balance it all with with everything else we have, we, we have going on for the community. Um, that's where that's what my thoughts are. Co-chair Parsons, anybody else? Any other commissioners uh, have any other thoughts or, or want to speak up to that? Well, I do. Um, as you recall, when I first got on the board here for the commission in 2020, we had four high priorities. This was one of them, is the field, the multi-purpose field action mission, along with Westside Park, Christian Center, doing the, uh, the pickleball courts and the softball got it continental. So this was one of the original priorities that we had on our list. And through this last evaluation, you know, it's shifted some of our maintenance uh, is lacking. So we, we can always take a look at that again and redetermine that. But if we want to put this back on the list, it's, Maybe squeeze something else or reevaluate those and certainly do that. But we go back to that original list. So just on the thought.
Sorry, I was just writing some notes. Thank you, Commissioner Parsons. Any other commissioners uh, thoughts on on how we might address this next steps? I, I think having the, that conversation, I agree. Let's look at what our, it, it does this fit within one of those other priorities and we're going to you know make an impact in, in in a certain way. This could could be something that fits nicely into that. Um, anybody, any other commissioners want to speak up to that before we move to the next uh, subject? Um, I, I would agree um, that it would be nice if we could piggyback this onto one of the other priorities that we have. Um, that seems like a best case scenario. There does seem to be, um, based on, on Mr. Anthony's and Mr. Sherry's uh, presentation today, you know, um, a, a need and a desire for this in the community. Um, but it would be difficult to place it at a priority higher than the other things we've been working on than the other things that have been waiting. Um, but yes, I, I think it would be a, a worthwhile endeavor to try to piggyback this onto a multi-purpose field or some other um, one of our projects that we have in the mix. Amy or Rebecca, did, is there any, have you guys uh, done any preliminary cost estimates of what it would take in order for something like this? And not, not that, you, you know, if we maybe for another meeting or something, but has that work been done to see what it would take to build and or maintain such a facility? That's another one of my notes was how much, how, what is the maintenance like on a track? Um, it's not, as far as I know, the city doesn't have any other tracks. So this would be the one facility. Is it, is it maintained in a comparable way as other facilities or is there extra equipment that needs to be bought just to maintain a track? I don't know any of those things. So um, from the parks and rec perspective, what are your guys, uh, any, any initial thoughts on that? Without any initial costing exercise, I think the the group the last time that we spoke with commission had some ballpark estimates, I believe, of a million dollars, if I'm not mistaken, for the track itself. So that would be outside a synthetic turf multi-purpose field in the center. Um, and as far as the, the maintenance of that material, I have taken a look at what is that lumberjack stadium around any used field, that soccer field there. Uh, it doesn't look like it's extremely difficult to maintain, but there's certainly some maintenance costs to it. But I, to me, that directly ties back to what is the surface first. If it's a poor in place type surface or a different type of material, and then there's also some considerations on just overall maintenance, if there's going to be a snow operation that would need to occur on that surface. So are we uh, encumbering the surface if we're doing a snow operation on it, we're just letting it self melt kind of thing so that we're preserving it. Um, so I think that we've got the estimate of about a million dollars ish on installation to deliver something like that. Again, outside of synthetic turf on the inside. And I, my guess would be maintenance costs on something like that without speaking with our partners at NEU is probably equivalent to a quarter of an FTE of full-time employee per year would be my guess on that full burden rate. Let's call that $20,000 a year to maintain. I love it. I love the fast figures. That's great. Thank you, Amy. So, and, that, and you know, that's also for Sean and Vince's benefit, just kind of, under, you know, these are things we have to weigh and talk about. And, you know, I, I, I worked for Cokio County and we did a great C post thing where we built all these facilities, but worked in no thoughts on maintain, maintaining those facilities and, and then just kind of runs into problems that way. So these are things that the commission has to be very intentional and, and um, uh, in thinking about some of those uh, uh, they, they, dominoes that may fall on, on, on uh, intentional uh, side effects. Ms. correct me if I'm wrong, in the last presentation, you were mentioning about uh, whether it's the crowdfunding or reaching out to the uh, you know, sponsors, all these professional athletes come here with the uh, apparel companies and everything else behind them, and maybe reaching out and getting funding for the track, specifically not the field, but just the track. Yeah, is that correct? Yeah, I think that we have, I think that we're connected well enough in the sport, I think we're connected well enough in the industry. I think Flagstaff is well enough known. Um, and I think there's enough people, both at the local, national, and international level, like to see this happen here, that we could crowdsource the, the million dollars. I do not think that that's out of the room of possibility um, at all. And I, and I, I mean, we, 
you know, as a counter example, we put up a um, a, ra a race, a virtual race fundraiser for a friend of ours that was, was battling with cancer a couple years ago. We raised two hundred thousand dollars in two weeks. Um, I, I we have we have those we have those connections. Um, so our original proposal in doing this was that we will carry some of the little. I mean, the idea was not to walk in this room and say, "Hey, build a track for us, you know." And thanks. <laughs> no, it's not that. The idea was that if there were some way we could partner, the the estimate, the the company that we had do the estimate for us on the turf field as well as the track did a two million dollar proposal on both. On the full facility, that's completely built, minus restrooms, minus parking, but just and that's everything. That's ground prep. That's all. Of it. So I think the idea would be that if if you guys decided to move forward and partner with us on it, we would commit to a million, raising a million for the track portion of that two million. Um, turf fields are neat. I don't play rugby, so it's not my thing. <laughs> but, you know, but I think it'd be a cool way to get to get involved. And get, and get the that maintenance estimate would be for the full expansion of the park since there could, would, could be a parking lot or would be a parking lot associated with it whether if it's uh, portable restrooms or a permanent restroom all other maintenance associated with that so that's not just to maintain the track service but approximately eight acres of developed land. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, you guys do see Commissioner Martin had a question in the comments. I'll uh, read that out loud real quick. Would your organization be willing to share with the maintenance costs of this track? And when you type that out, it made me think of out here at Tut Hill, we have the bike park and we have bike park volunteers that help manage and maintain some of that? Or is there is there anything that you think uh, they could do in support of the uh, upkeep of the track? And I don't know if the city is open to those type of relationships, but uh, anyway, what, what can you say to that, guys? Yeah, I would say some of the revenue that is realized from the hosting of um, international elite track and field athletes, you know, we could certainly discuss the possibility of apportioning some of that to go towards track maintenance. Similarly, with with you know group runs like team run fly staff, I think we, I mean, we're making a contribution now, right, to the university and to the schools. Um, so similarly, I, I would imagine we would continue to pay dues. As I said earlier, some of these international uh, governing bodies for the sport may very well be fine with an additional surcharge, you know, on their training camp invoices, if you will. Um, that involves, you know, money that goes directly toward the track to maintain it. I think that's very, very highly possible. Excellent. What I, I believe you've satisfied the uh, my questions and the questions of my cohorts here. Um, as mentioned, we do need to talk through this as a commission um, and just see how this if this can fit into an existing project priority and, and if so, where and how. And so um, I believe the next steps for us will be done at, at the potentially at the next uh, meeting so we can move uh, on to other other subjects for this meeting. Um, is there are there any other thoughts before we move on? And I just want to thank Vince and, and Sean for your time today and answering our questions and, and coming to the meeting, uh, the one I missed and uh, initially with the proposal. So thank you for your, all of your time and energy on this. Um, anything else from you guys to us? Uh, just thank you for your consideration. And uh, if there's anything that I can do to uh, move the effort forward, if there are follow up questions, just have Rebecca reach out to me and I'll do my best to answer them. Yeah, I would echo that. Thanks a lot for, for having us in here. Really appreciate it. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Uh, you're welcome to stick around if you'd like. Uh, we're going to move on to the Thorpe Park Annex update. All right, I will kick this off. Um, we have an introduction uh, with one of our partners on this. So. Uh, if, it, if 
All the commissioners recall Fort Park Annex has been great at this point, greater than a year long uh, process where we've done a full public participation, including many different forms of outreach to the public. And it um, has been an amazing process to go through. So I want to introduce our, our, our partner on this, Southwest Decision Resources. We've got both Andy Rogers and Carrie Everly here with that group. They'll kick things off. Before though they kick things off, I want everyone to remember that what we're going to go through today tonight is pretty much the process that this team has gone through over the greater than the last 12 months. Some of the considerations, a lot of the outreach, a lot of the focus groups, a lot of the feedback we received from the community. I think the biggest thing to remember is what will be displayed here this evening to all of you as well as next week to our city council is a concept design. Um, so we want to keep that in mind. And, and that was going to be the end result of this whole process was to go through this with our community and then take a concept design to city council to have it be adopted for when there is future funding available. This gives us a guideline, if you will, or a, a, a book to say this is what the community elected in 2022 to do with these eight acres at Thorpe Park. So please keep that in mind as you're listening to everything from um, Southwood's Decision Resources. Take it away, Ms. Rackers. It is a mouthful. It's, it's not. Marking it. Give us one second. It sounds like those on the phone can't see the presentation, correct? Oh, um, the, the, if you look at my screen, you'll see that. Editing. View. Oh, great. This is also, um, we were able to present last week to the Indigenous Commission. Um, so this is our second go around from this. So I, actually after this, after any questions, anything, would love any feedback to help us best prepare for next week with City Council and invite anyone to attend or view that next week too. So Brian, Commissioner Martin could see it before, but he can't see it any longer. Commissioner Martin, we're trying to get it reloaded. So hopefully it displays here again soon. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it on the screen, but it looks like it's not the like the play version. It's like it's the one you can edit and modify, but I do see a presentation on the screen. Yeah. It's a large presentation with a lot of images, which can create some um, issues for us in getting this loaded. So, you know, y'all get to be our guinea pig on this too. I think we have it. How is that now for Maha? Huh, interesting, it's still showing the slides out to the yeah. left. Well, if you're all okay, mm -hmm. are y'all right if we go through it, even though the slides are on the left there? Oh yeah, it's, I mean, I'm fine the way it is. If Everybody else is cool. Okay. It, may with, it may mess with our animation just a little bit, so bear with us. <laughs> so thank you um, to the commissioners for inviting us back uh, to the city. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you uh, over the last year. We did speak with you last December when we had just gotten started on the project. So again, here to kind of tell you what we've been up to for the last year. So we will introduce you again to ourselves. Uh, we also work with Leap Design Group. Their, their uh, logo was on the previous slide. That was the landscape architect that we used throughout this process. We'll talk about our goals and approach for the community engagement, um, specifically what types of tools we've used over the last year. The community has really come out um, to, to be with us in this process. So that's a real honor for Carrie and I. We're both locals. We've lived here for a long time and, and are very invested interest in what becomes of this park as well. And then here we are. We're here at some concepts, as Amy mentioned. So, you know, we understand that beyond concept, there are a lot of 
more specific decisions. But um, we're here today to tell you how we got there and then present two final draft final concepts. That's what we're calling them. So we are uh, FDR, Southwest Decision Resources. We're a team of facilitators. And then WEAT um, in the, on the top row there is contracted. We're contracted by the city to work on this project. We've also had the pleasure of working with wonderful city staff along the way, Amy, Rebecca, Rose, and Mark. And we work in Flagstaff, Tucson, the Southwest, and beyond. Our company is based uh, primarily out of Tucson with offices in Flagstaff and Phoenix. Our role for this project was really to facilitate this broad community engagement and develop this robust concept for the annex parcel. And as you recall, it's about nine acres located where the public works building used to be. We're hoping, or not hoping, it's going to city council in a couple of weeks. So here we are, um, we're presenting that. And again, we really wanted this to be robust and transparent as we moved along the process. And there's just an aerial shot of the place that we're talking about. So our approach to community engagement is that we foster multiple methods. We focus on inclusivity, interactive, and iterative strategies, meaning each method builds upon the feedback that we've learned from the previous. No one project is alike. No one community is alike. And so we really use the community dialogue to move forward. Here's one um, in-house meeting that we had. Were you able to attend the meeting? Great, sure. good. Anyone else on the phone able to attend any of our in-person meetings um, on site? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. It's so nice to present. I feel like it's like a just one-on-one -on -one here to be. Um, tonight, tonight we'll talk about, this is where my animation is gonna mess up, but tonight we'll talk about three, three spaces. The listening and learning space that was sort of phase one, the conversation and design space where we got together in together as a community to talk about the future of this parcel. And here we are at refinement and approval. So the listening and learning session, first we started with these vested partner discussions, which I'll go into um, in a little bit. But as you know, this parcel has a long history. There are strong opinions about this. So we really started with a subset of these vested partners with one on one discussions with them. We also launched our first of two community surveys at that time and then held these virtual information sessions to ground the community in what was ahead. So we had 41 of these vested partner discussions. Sometimes they were one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes they were with groups. And we also had targeted presentations to you all, to the Indigenous Peoples Advisory Council, to the Indigenous Commission, which Amy mentioned we just spoke with last week, the Indigenous Circle of Flagstaff, and then we have, did have one organized athletic group meeting as well. So those presentations were very helpful for us. They were allowed folks to let us know their interest in those uh, pieces of those parcel, what they'd like to see, what they've worked on in the past, things like that. From those discussions, we really started to, to drill down to visions and values of this area. Nature, it being natural, was a vision and value. They like the the mixed use, both passive and active re recreation, angling at the pond, also being able to, you know, um, walk on the Futz Trail, things like that. They loved its central location and the ability to have a family-centered atmosphere. When we talked about potential programming, and again, this was very early on with just those vested discussions and targeted uh, discussions, the Indigenous Community and Cultural Center had always been something that was of interest and continued to be right till the very end here. Um, court sports such as pickleball, the pickleball community was, was um, present and, and made their wishes known. Um, a relocated dog park was of interest. We understand that the dog park is, can turn into a skating rink in the wintertime. And it was also important that the community was interested in some sort of community event space. So those were initial thoughts on programming. Throughout the project, we had a lot of outreach, both through a project-specific website, as well as a very um, detailed Facebook page that would advertise events and things like that and allow for commentary and discussion on it. Um, we also did a lot of targeted emails to, especially to those early um, vested states, vested groups in the beginning. It's a little bit hard to see. Our, our listening and learning sessions, we held two of these. These were recorded and then put on the website. We had over 200 participants registered for those. And really the idea there was to get everybody at the same place. 
What is the history and the background of the policy of the parcel? What are any guiding policies such as ordinance 425 that are currently in place on the parcel? And then really we wanted to talk to them and get their insights on the collaborative approach ahead. We try to approach these types of things very humbly. We wanted to hear from our Flagstaff community on how best to really engage in robust dialogue. So our first community survey was launched pretty early on, right after we did those initial assessment with folks. And it was using Google Forms so that we could ask us put all sorts of pictures in there. We subdivided the parcel to kind of break it down in terms of what might be most appropriate there. It was open to all community members for six weeks, and we got more than a thousand responses, which we were thrilled about. I hope to tell Martin Ince that I think our survey got more hits than his does, but I'm gonna have to get that. We, we might have got more. <laughs> um, so it was a really robust survey. We got a lot of early information about this parcel. Um, for the first community value was interestingly enough and in what you hope it is it does it was consistent with some of our early vested partner discussions nature and indigenous values were very important and it also included the benefit of walkability and bikeability the central location and then also francis short pond and, and angling opportunities also showed up so that was again community values associated with the first survey when we looked at programming activities, there were about 30 that rose to the top. Um, you can see those there, athletic courts, fields, bike, parks, and pump tracks. I won't read them all. I will draw your attention to those in sort of the tan color, which are ones that kind of rose to the top. So those included athletic courts, the ICCC, community event or festival space, gardens, you can see gardens way out there, open air markets, outdoor amphitheaters, obviously as we get close to these concepts, some of those things overlap, performing arts, space, and outdoor pavilions. And then another thing I want to draw your attention to is housing. There it is, thank you. You can see housing here, and I want to bring this up because housing is not currently um, highlighted from our early discussion, but I will say it's always been a very active area of discussion. It became much more active as we moved through the process. And so while it didn't make our first cut, it continued to be something that people were very interested in in some camps and very not interested in other camps. So again, one of those issues that we knew early on might be contentious, strong opinions in both directions. I'm going to pause there and I'm gonna switch over to my colleague, Gary. Great. Good evening. Thank you, Andy. I'm Carrie Everly, also with Southwest Decision Resources. So picking up where Andy um, left off, that really encompassed all the things that were all the activities within the listening and learning phase of this effort. From that, we developed um, kind of this conversations and design portion of, of um, community engagement. In doing so, um, we designed two, or we came up with two design sessions. The first one, um, so both of them on site, the first one really getting to know this parcel for those who maybe hadn't been on there since it was a public works yard, um, some activities associated with that, and then um, a second design session that again built on the first. I think we're going to need to pause for a moment because we just lost Petitioner Conway, which means we don't have quorum. Mm -hmm. And hopefully he's just transitioning. There he is. All <laughs> <laughs> right, you can begin again. We have a quorum again. Okay. So, um, so this these activities here will go into further detail, but are really talking about this conversations and design portion um, of this effort. So to give you a little bit of detail about the two design sessions, the first one was really to get to know the parcel, to take the information that was garnered from the first community survey and have people walk and place things on um, in different areas with the, across the parcel, as well as um, participate in a build a park activity. So really striving to take those elements that were highlighted in the first survey and be able to have people place those on um, a big table to see, can we have it all? Or 
do we need to, um, you know, give and take a little more? That session then um, segued into our design session where um, we came up with three distinct designs from all of the first effort. Um, and then we had people um, give us feedback on those. So here you can see some pictures um, on the top. This was that effort of having people visit different stations throughout the parcel and um, and look at kind of the matrices of experiences. Did they want a more um, you know established structured recreation experience? Did they want something more nature and passive type of recreation experience? And we asked people to do that across the different portions of the site. Um, we also had them view a presentation where we um, gave a review of the survey results that you all just saw that Andy mentioned. And then we got to um, have a build a park. And that's that lower picture where you can see a bike park, you can see tennis courts, different configurations of pickleball courts, amphitheaters, all to scale. So those were all built to scale based on the table size photos of the park itself. Um, again, here you can see those pictures, the lower right, where people are actively placing um, elements on this parcel. And all of these stations were facilitated, um, notes were taken on flip charts, any kind of descending or dissenting opinions were noted as well, where people could agree and could not agree. Um, we were lucky enough to have two food trucks at this event and it was really well attended. Um, upwards of 150 to 175 community members at this particular session. So taking all of that data that we gathered, all these pictures of build the parks, this matrices of experiences, um, we were so lucky to have Wheat Design Group help us come up with three distinct concepts. And each of the concepts had common elements of which Andy mentioned earlier, this indigenous community cultural center. Um, all of the, the concepts you will see have that. They have garden and orchard space, community event and performing art space, as well as um, space for open air markets. Okay, lots of words on the screen here, but I wanna give you guys time. If you haven't seen these already via Facebook or via um, the project website, the first concept is called back to nature. Really the least um, infrastructure concept. A lot of open space, green space. Um, so no less of that kind of um, highly active recreation opportunities here. So um, ample market space, a large event space, um, that could be kind of facing one way for smaller venues, facing a different way for larger venues. Um, and then it really promoted revegetation as well. As you can see in the, um, the lower right portion of the parcel, um, a lot of revegetation there, as well as multiple areas of gardens and orchards. Okay, so to contrast the back to nature, we had um, concept B, which is called family fitness and fun. This was the most um, active rec recreation option that came out of this effort. So um, courts, there are pickleball courts, there um, is a really large play area, there's a skate spot. So really emphasizing um, active recreation in this one, as well as in the buffer, a relocated dog park. This also incorporated a half mile fitness loop, a, a, around the entire parcel area. Um, there's some three on three um, basketball inside the existing garage bays, but also incorporated the um, community garden aspect as well as orchard possibilities as well. This one was the attempt to try and get something for everyone. So this one's entitled something for all. Um, this was the best um, way to try to incorporate the active and passive recreation opportunities. So pickleball courts, but only four instead of the six previous. Um, a, an addition, like the uh, amphithe amphitheater space, so performing art space, play area, um, a skate park, community gardens as well, 
pollinator garden along a path, um, some market space surrounding the um, Indigenous Community and Cultural Center. And then this one also in that um, lower right portion of the parcel incorporated seven units of employee housing, um, and that being a two story maximum height. All right, so lots to digest there. Hopefully this isn't the first time you've all seen those concepts. Um, so then the second portion of this conversations and design phase was a second design session where we asked the community to come back again to, to the site to review those three concepts we just reviewed, to look at them, to rate each one from, I absolutely love this, to, oh my gosh, I could never believe this, or I can't imagine this. Um, and then to give us a little bit of feedback, what is it that you like about it, or what would you change? So for the in-person portion, you can see that the tables were paired with a concept, like the actual diagram, some information like you saw on the right hand side of those um, that kind of gave a broader explanation. And then everyone was given a data sheet. And these data sheets are basically kind of a Likert scale of one to five, can't imagine, absolutely love it. And then we asked people to provide open-ended feedback in addition. So paired with this in-person design, we recognize that to be as inclusive as possible, we, like Andy said, we have to have multiple methods, right? So we had an in-person option with people looking at things, talking with their neighbors, writing things down, but some people couldn't make it on a Saturday to this event. So we offered through the community forum on the City of Flagstaff website, um, a survey that was the exact replica of the data sheet that we gave people on site. So again, it was open to all community members. It was open for five weeks and we got 631 responses. So again, more data, data on data on data. And that helps really get to this refinement and approval portion of, these, um, of this effort. So this includes data refinement and coding, um, commission presentations and city council review, releasing this to the public. Maybe some of you have seen this on Facebook on the many different areas in which it's been shared. Um, and basically it came down to two very, very, very similar concepts with one minor change. And ideally this will, one of these will move forward um, as the approved concept. So um, getting all of this data into a final concept. Um, the final concept is a combination of those three initial concepts, A, B, and C. But really, we are really lucky to have a colleague of ours, Jessica, who is a PhD student and has a lot of proficiency with coding. She coded 1,435 comments in a way that could help hone into what are those essential elements that have to be in the concept based on levels of support and feedback from the community. So elements that are common to both concept one and one B are community garden space, ethnobotanical garden and orchard. This is primarily surrounding the ICCC. Event space, a fitness loop, as I mentioned, the ICCC and adjacent ceremonial space. Market space, pickleball courts, a play area, and a skate park pump track. This be fun. <laughs> All right, so because the animation it's messy. <laughs> doesn't work because of the presentation mode, all of these key elements are they can't see it. They can only see the shared screen. You can point. You can press that. Oh, I'll do that. Sorry, I just stand up there. <laughs> so, um, so the existing fleet building um, is the element that is the Indigenous Community Cultural Center, um, and just to the east of that traditional ceremonial space. Moving to the south is the ethnobotanical gardens and orchards, um, kind of rehabilitating what is is the parking lot currently. Um, and then below that, to the south, is 55 parking stalls, recognizing if if we're, um, if you build it and they come, they have to have a place to park. Um, to the left of that is the play area 
and next to that is a skate park and pump track integrated. Space for a community garden and adjacent to the sustainability center um, and the offices of sustainability. The garage bay would stay and have indoor basketball courts. Um, to the north of that is um, the pickleball area with an additional 22 parking stalls. And um, so six courts there kind of separated with some vegetation. And then to the left in the buffer is the relocated um, Thorpe Park Park. Oh, sorry. And at your 12 o'clock um, is an indoor outdoor flex event space. Um, there was a lot of support for having event space and many, many folks um, contributed feedback that having an indoor and an outdoor um, option would be beneficial. So this is concept one. Concept 1B is the exact same with the exception of those 55 parking stalls in the southeast corner would become city employee housing and 23 parking stalls. Um, so all other elements are exactly the same with the exception of housing and a reduction in the parking stalls. You go back and forth. Uh, let's for those, that are not those awful circles. So all of that to say that um, that's how we got here. A lot of iterations, um, a lot of interactive options. Um, it's what we like to, to really focus on. And um, hopefully that was clear and we are completely open for questions. Well, and also mentioned that we um, posted this to the community in several different ways. Um, a, a tar some targeted emails out to some of those vested partners, as well as an update to the website and um, the Facebook page. There is some good dialogue happening there. There's a lot of questions. Hopefully those folks will come to the city council meeting or find ways to get their um, questions answered. Um, at this time, we'd love to, to address any questions about the process, where we've arrived and then send it back to you, um, Chair, for, uh, for what you'd like to do from here. The Indigenous Commission did take a vote. I understand it kind of depends on where you want to take it. Um, so there's there's that. We present this again in the work session on the 25th. Yes. And this is the identical presentation that we'll be given there. So this goes to Council on the 25th? Yes. Next okay. week. Yeah. So I'll just say what we do need from the commission for our council presentation is at least a thumbs up, thumbs down type discussion. Um, or if you'd like, you can take a vote and make a recommendation on one or one B. Or you can take a vote and just say that we're moving in the right direction and you recommend this to go to city council. Either way, we need to be able to tell city council what the commission thinks about. And I think we're gonna have to stop sharing so that our co-chair can see the meeting. Can you, I don't want to have a change. I see uh, Commissioner Martin has his hand up. Can I speak? Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm I finally am able to actually communicate other than through the chat. So I wanted um this looks great. Great job, you guys. This is I couldn't imagine the tremendous amount of work you guys had to put this through with the whole the whole entire year that you have been doing this. So thank you so much for all the hard work, dedication, and time you've spent on it. It looks really good. Um, if I was to, I, I think either position um, proposition, either one with the, with the with employee housing or without looks, I, I like either one, um, depending on what the cities go through. I, um, I think either looks great. That is my opinion. And I just wanted to tell you guys, thank you. And it looks good. Thank you. It's our pleasure. So is it one or the other or both concepts get presented to council? Both concepts will be presented to council. Okay. This exact same presentation will occur a week yeah. from tomorrow for city council. Okay.
I mean, I'll, I'll add that explanation on the housing because we had mixed results and no clear community direction on housing and knowing that there are many things that would need to take place if council would like to see housing after this process. We felt that that was a policy decision that we needed to present to council. Um, and let them tell us which way they'd like us to yeah, go. Yeah, because it seemed like the community in general had kind of mixed feelings about it. Uh, so that's what I heard about it in that, uh, that session. So, Let's see what that goes. Yeah. I like both concepts. I can get support. I know pickleball is always going to push back. You don't, you don't have enough courts. Um, I'm not even sure that's where. The bulk of the pickleball should go anyhow. Um, so, that being said, the other thing that I think worth considering and what the council may bring up is we do move the dog park. What are we doing with those leftover areas now that become available for some other than use? Is there a use that's currently shown as part of this uh, thing that maybe moves over to where the the dog park was repurposed. Maybe I think that's an excellent point to bring up. Um, and, and I think if asked that by anyone on city council, we know that we always are in need of parking at Fort Park. Being a 219 acre regional park, we always need parking. Right. It, even for daily use, for the own athletics that the city of Flagstaff um, programs, for tournaments, you name it. So I can, and, and knowing that that dog park, lovely as it is, it's constructed on top of a drainage yeah. easement and basically a drainage facility. So it's not, I don't know if there is a, a strong use other than parking spaces. Right. Just to be frank on that, uh, yeah. and knowing that we do have that need, it's not a need that's discussed frequently at this commission about parking, parking, parking. But we do have a need there in this. This is our it's our largest regional park. Uh, so I could see that being a good use. And so that's not taking a use away from what's on this concept final draft design over to um, there. It's, it's but it is fulfilling a need in the entire park. And just so you know, I'm a landscape architect. Yes. Yeah. So that's why I've come at this. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and my next one. So Amy, I would anticipate that question. Yeah. That is at least what I'm counting on having to answer one yeah. that night. We have a couple hands raised here. Uh, Commissioner Mark, you had your hand raised. Uh, I'll be I'll speak quick because I've always spoken once. Uh, I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation for um, just giving us the two designs, especially for city council. Um, I, I know that the city housing, we haven't heard of anything de decisive on yes for it or not for it. Um, I, I don't want to express my opinion here. I don't I don't think that's my position for this uh, for this commission to do that for this, but I wanted to express my appreciation and taking the time doing the effort and make including that anyways. I, I think that's important and I I agree with you with with the idea of proposing both of them. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Martin. Uh, Commissioner Linsky, you have your hand raised as well. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, I also want to thank you for putting together that presentation and for allowing us to walk through all the steps with you again. It has been a long time since we did that, so it was nice to refresh and have the opportunity to think back on how it started and, and what the process was and to see the photos of the people actually um, placing, you know, tennis courts and pickleball courts and dog parks and just letting them visualize that I think was um, a, just a brilliant idea and also probably um, very, very helpful and, and led to some really great decision making because people had that opportunity to see it in real time. And I, um, I really appreciate that. I'm very impressed with um, both designs. I don't have an opinion on the housing and so I don't have anything to say there. I um, am happy you know that it's an option and if it's needed and if uh if it's something that the council decides is appropriate then great and as for pickleball um 
I think six courts is wonderful. I play tennis and I play pickleball and I never could understand what the point was for a 20 court facility. I really don't think that was appropriate ever, um, in my opinion, but six courts, um, on that side of town, plus the sports courts at the new Boulder port, uh, park, plus the Ponderosa courts, plus, you know, just having them at different areas in town is is going to make a huge difference and is going to be very valuable to pickleball players and to tennis players when they show up to play tennis and people are playing pickleball on the tennis courts. So I think it's going to be great. And I love the incorporation of the indigenous, of the gardens. I'm a huge, huge fan of of native species and getting more plants and shrubs and trees going. And um I know that what you guys have put together may not please some people because it doesn't give them what they want. But if you've ever heard the old adage that um, if everyone's unhappy, then it's a good plan. So I like it. <laughs> I like both uh, one and one A, uh, one B, you know, just the difference being the housing. I'm in support of either. So well done. Thank you. Sure, Robin or Conway, do you have anything to add to that? Hi, yes. Uh, I'm in a position where I can talk now. Hello, everybody. Well, let me put this around. All right, cool. Hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah, so I love the, love the uh, proposals, love the design concepts. Um, I feel like I would rather see additional parking and maybe not have the uh, city of Flagstaff housing, but I am, I love both concepts and think that if council wants to make that decision, that's uh, perfect for them to do so. So if we as a commission, it sounds like we all like both concepts and would, would be in favor of that. So in terms of our position to council, I think that that's what that is, is that we uh, all, we like both concepts and uh, kind of defer to council on the importance of that housing. Um, my opinion, though, is um, like like Amy was saying about the existing door park is parking is always an issue. Um, why sacrifice a bunch of parking? Um, but uh, I don't know the need for community or for city housing. So that's my two cents. Uh, great work, as always. Love the behind the scenes and seeing all the, the pictures and, and what got us to that process. I think council is going to very much appreciate that background and all that information. Um, and so great work and I appreciate all the effort. Also, uh, shout out to Beck for providing 95% of those photos for our presentation. So thank you, thanks Beck. And we have not heard from Commissioner Robin. Would you like to chime in? Commissioner Rowden, are you there? There she is. Hi, sorry. I didn't realize I was still on mute. <laughs> um, I just say thank you for all of the research and information. Um, like others have said, I don't really know much about like the housing part and what the needs are there, but I can definitely understand like the parking needs and I don't really have much else to say. I think it was just a very good like, presentation, and I thank you for your time. Any suggestions from any commissioners um, on so do we describe both concepts as is and with this employee housing piece on it? Um, it Go ahead, Eve. just one tiny thought there that came up last time, and I, I don't know that we've been clear enough on it, is it's city housing. So Correct. I need to be very clear on why it's city housing, which again, we didn't talk about right tonight. So maybe clarifying that for this right. commission too, to understand, because it does kind of stand out. It's not just housing. Yeah, you need to point out the fact right. that this parcel does not allow housing. As currently, currently right, currently so this based on an ordinance, yes. Sure. Um, so would it be, you know, is, is there some feedback that it would be beneficial to expand maybe on some of that on um, when we get to that slide? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you always need to touch if you're going to present that. I think you should put in there, you know, the fact that whatever that shortage of employee housing, the fact that 
know, there's a reason you're proposing. Right. So what is that reason? Which, and there was some, uh, that was see some of the reason that it's even being proposed is from some of the feedback in the outreach facilitation process that, uh, that we went through. Um, there is zero city housing in the city at all. Right. So, I mean, I certainly think we could, we could talk about that and just expand a little, or we could turn it back to you to close out to really kind of give some of this new right. stuff since you opened it to, I think there's, I think we go there. I don't want to pin it on. We're not experts on right. city ordinances. I would just, I think since you're giving the bulk of the presentation, certainly we can answer questions, but I think that SDR can certainly explain the current zoning allows for this type of housing. And because our public comments were not conclusive about yes. seeing or no, we wanted to put that for council and staff is here to answer the question in this picture. Um, and we do, Mr. Conway, we've got several hands. So I'll let you get back to leading the meeting if you'd like. Oh, golly, I'm on my phone and I never do this on my phone. Let me see order. So Commissioner Rowden, uh, you're up first for comment, please. Oh, sorry, I didn't have any comments other than what I had just done. I just forgot to lower my hand. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, next would then be Commissioner Linsky. OK, thank you. Um, one thing I had a question about, well, I have a one question and one comment. First of all, on the designs, a question I have is, I can't see it anymore, but there uh, were some little orange dots around everything. Is that a path around the entire, for people to walk? That is, right. that is there, a path? Yes, there are three, three sized paths within, and thank you. This really helps us in terms of when we present to council. There's a five foot path, a 10 foot path, and a 15 foot path. So the path that goes around the entire um, property, that fitness loop is a 10 foot path. Um, the market space is larger, obviously, because it's in intended to be a path, but also open air markets. And then the five foot paths are these connectors that go between play areas through the ethnobotanical area kind of through the property. So thanks for, for bringing that out. We can be more specific on that when we show these again. Yeah, I think that would be a good thing to point out because I know that one thing people like to do is is just walk around the entire park when they go. Um, if they're not playing or their children are, you know, goofing around, they like to just walk around the entire thing. So that's a nice option to have. And then um, I was just wondering how is there anything to share with us or any takeaways from your presentation to the indigenous groups? Um, were they pleased with the, with the proposals? Were they, um, did they have any concerns or particularly interesting things to add? I'll speak first and then Becca. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I think overall they were pleased. Of course, they're thrilled that the community supports the ICCC. Um, they really love the, the vegetation and sort of the walkway um, coming into it. Um, they had some very helpful um, helpful thoughts in terms of our presentation and specific words. So those have been incorporated. And um, they did move to vote on the one without housing. Um, we also heard from one of the commissioners that he was able to take the build a park to some native youth at Flagstaff High School. And so he did bring forward, I was, we hadn't heard that he had the time to do that. So it was really wonderful to have him present the youth voices, which were consistent with some of the design concepts that we settled on. So that was, that was good. What else would you add? I don't think I would add anything. Um, perhaps there, there were a couple of comments about so there, there's a difference between concept and going to design. And so these are elements that we want to include in this property somehow, some way. There were a few questions about um, things that are more detailed or specific that will come out in, a in the actual design process. 
And so we had some clarifying comments that this is just concept and those things would come out in design. There were some comments about in design, making sure that we are being very careful to think about compatibility of the different elements on the site and how they interact or don't with each other. For example, pickleball noise and perhaps an indigenous ceremony going on in the performing arts space. So those are all things that we'll absolutely need to consider as we move towards design. All right, I'm um, gonna go with Commissioner Martin and then we'll go, we'll circle back to uh, Linsky. Well, it sounds like maybe there will be some diversity and inclusion um, <laughs> with that type of design if both is occurring at the same time. Maybe some just understanding and just respecting of each other's doing their own business. Um, I, I, it's, I was actually thinking you were going with a different direction about maybe city employee housing and noise over the park in general in that area, no matter if what of type of event or the event that is going on or activity, if there was employee housing being there, but um, let alone if there'd be enough parking for even for employee housing. But um, I think originally my original um, thought was was that city council, I think, is very well knowledgeable about the city's housing needs and what type of, especially with the election coming up, I think they're very well aware of what their current housing stock is and what they currently have. So I think just reminding them of the ordinance that is placed on, that's why it's specifically employee housing and how it came to that conclusion would be probably the only thing that is necessary. Um, if that makes you a little bit more comfortable presenting it that way is that they are very well aware of what the um, housing needs are. Um, and maybe they just need to be reminded that according to the ordinance for this property, it can only be this type of housing and um, they can do with that with what they wish. Um, I think otherwise, I think you just did a great job. Thank you. So if I could respond to that, Commissioner Martin, I want us to be very clear about existing ordinance. Ordinance 425, which Andy mentioned, only allows for park, museum, or recreational experiences and programming. So ordinance 425 would have to be changed if the council wants to go towards the housing options. So those are the next steps that we would need to go into if council chooses that option. I think exactly stating that and making that clear would be helpful. Um, I'm sure if they decided to change it from employee housing or other housing or housing in general, I think they would be more inclined and easily able to change that ordinance if they would like it sound um, right. Yeah. I don't think it would be a big deal at all, but, but I think it, it will be Commissioner Martin and that's exactly why we felt it was a staff decision. Um, in addition, the reason that it's focused on city employee housing is that's based on the zoning of the existing property. Wow. So it's a zoned public facility. The only kind of housing that that zoning allows for is city employee housing. Um, well, maybe stating maybe the zoning, that is what the zoning is. Um, allowing for, and maybe they will they will have the understanding of how you came to that conclusion, um, and just maybe stating that. I, I don't think the ordinance wouldn't be a big deal to change, to modify um, just a little bit for if they did decide to put that into the final design. Um, well, I guess we'll find out. But I think that's all that needs to be said is, you know, the zoning, this is the requirements of the zoning. This is how we came to that conclusion. And I think that that's all you would need to put on that concept. Thank you. Commissioner Linsky. And then maybe we move on to the next, like kind of get final comments after this one and, and move to the next topic if possible. Sure, thank you. Real quick, 
Becca, I just wanted to, uh, you addressed the noise about uh, the indigenous um, meeting, how pickleball impacts that and how they impact pickleball. And I just wanted to uh, let you know in case you may have already done research on this or um, looked into it, but down at Forest Highlands, um, the pickleball courts were quite a a problem for the housing closest to the tennis courts and the pickleball courts and they had uh some insulated sort of um i don't even know how, how you would Who's describe it? it there you go uh some panels put up on the fence um <laughs> for the pickleball court that sort of absorbs some of the sound for the homeowners that were closest to the pickleball court so um, something like that is definitely a possibility if the the dinking of the ball and the paddles becomes too much for events taking place at the same time. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. And that's exactly the type of detail that we would need to consider during design because those acoustic panels um, also need to take into consideration elevation of the courts in relation to the housing and everything else around it. So yeah, thanks for letting us know that Forest Highlands has done that though. I'd love to go down there and check them out. Put it around the new ones shortly too. Sounds like a field trip. Well, thank you, commissioners. Any any other final thoughts, uh, comments? Uh, and then I guess going to Rebecca and team, did we give you what you needed as part of that process um, besides the experience of uh, trying out that presentation? Yeah, I think we have clear direction from the four of you, which is majority. And thank you, each of those of you that we called on directly because I needed to hear from four of you. <laughs> to know that we have a uh, um, consensus from, so the way that we'll state is we have consensus from this commission that um, you're in approval of both of the concepts, um, but are not ready to make a recommendation on housing. I believe that to be an accurate representation of the conversation that I heard as well. All right, well, thank you uh, again for all of the work on that. that. That was an incredibly well done presentation in the process um, that I, I know how challenging that can be. And, and it sounds like you got a lot of great response. So and, and um, those are really great designs and I'm excited to see this moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Andy, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thanks. Our pleasure. In the interest of time, can I? Should we do number? Should we do letter D first, just to see, and and might be able to figure that out real quick. As it's 5:43, we might be able to get through all of item C, but I just want to make sure we talked about item D before we get all um, crazy. I do have to, I have another meeting that begins right at six that I have to go to. So actually, Commissioner um, or Chair, I would recommend that we skip C and take that up at our next meeting and that can be our main focus in November. I love it. Um, should we also add on for November a discussion on the track, uh, running track? I think they're re related in some way. They, they certainly are, yeah, you bet. Excellent, then I agree with that. Let's go ahead and postpone item C, the priorities um, for the November meeting, which as it happens, we got to make sure we are on the right schedule for. So as the agenda notes, it is currently scheduled for the week of Thanksgiving, um, which can be challenging for people uh, to, to be able to make that. So um, I don't remember what we did last year. If we just went for a December meeting, are we going to run into the same issue around Christmas time? Uh, I haven't looked that far ahead. So, uh, Rebecca, staff, what, what are you guys thinking? Yeah, it's typically so Thanksgiving's a little bit early this year. So we typically don't have this problem with this commission. We always have this problem with the Open Spaces Commission, which meets on the fourth Monday. 
Um, so yeah, my recommendation would be to, if, if the commission thinks that meeting on the 21st will be a problem, I'd recommend the 14th. Um, and then in December, I'm looking, our December meeting is scheduled for the 19th, which is a full week before Christmas holiday. But I understand a lot, I'm guessing that kids are out of school by then, if that's an issue. Well, and I'll say for myself, I would be unavailable on November 14th. I'll be at a conference uh, that day. So if, if we had to move the November one, I would be, uh, I'm available on the 21st. I don't think I have anything uh, that would impact my, my availability on that day. Uh, any other commissioners with a conflict or want to discuss that, that November 21st? Commissioner Parsons said that he spoke with the twenty-first. I do want to take a oh, right. sorry, Brown, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I'm good with the 21st. Commissioner Martin. Uh, Rebecca, what were you saying? Um, so I do want to take a moment, and I think this is the best time in the agenda to do so. Um, we will be losing Commissioner Linsky. Um, her seat is up for uh, reappointment, and she uh, graciously was able to stay with us and continue until the end of her term, but that is up and it will be reappointed by council tomorrow. So this is her last meeting, and I just wanted to publicly say thank you so much, Commissioner Linsky. Um, your comments have always been thoughtful and thought-provoking. And really, you've just been an invaluable commissioner, and thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate that. And um, thank you, everyone, for allowing me this opportunity. And I really uh, wish you all the best of luck and look forward to seeing what you all decide and come up with going forward. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner Linsky. Yeah, you will be missed. So I think we just haven't heard from Commissioner Martin about the November date. Sorry, I wasn't. I was trying not to interrupt anybody, but thank you, Commissioner Linsky. Um, best luck in whatever you're 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 going to be doing in the future. Thank you so much for dedicating so much time towards this. Um, I'm fine with the 21st. I, I will probably be similar to today. Um, 20, is it? Oh, next month, 21st. I'm fine with the 21st. I'll probably be similar to today where I am a chat only for a little bit, and then I'll be eventually be able to be act as normal um, just because of conflicting schedules, but I'm fine with that. Sounds good. We'll leave it as scheduled. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, good, good forethought and looking ahead at that. Um, but it seems like we're, we should be good with that date. And now again, on the agenda so far, uh, we will talk about the priorities cost estimate and five year planning, and, uh, which would include a discussion on the running track um, that we, we had a proposal on today, uh, follow up on the proposal from last month. So um, it'll be a, a good meeting. Um, lots, lots to go over. Um, and I look forward to that. Uh, let's go on. I know uh, Council Member Salas is not available, so reports. Um, I love the new format on the uh, Parks and Rec and Open Space. Um, and it's almost like a newsletter, but it's, it's re really well done, very uh, aesthetically pleasing. So that, that's great. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, I, any, ca any commissioners have any um, questions on the reports provided as part of the packet or is there any uh, staff members that want to highlight anything and i do see commissioner martin has his hand up go ahead commissioner martin i'm just going to be quick i think it looks great and a lot more fun and i think i think it looks good so whoever's doing it thank you so much for the time and i, I like it thank you so i'll just give some background um we, for our city leadership, we have been doing for years a weekly report 
and many of our other divisions in the city just do a monthly report. So our vision was to create a an engaging monthly report similar to a newsletter as mentioned. And we want that to double as our report to this commission. Um, certainly, we'll try to include some of the data and information that you've been requesting um, on a routine basis, probably rotating through those quarterly. Um, for example, trail counts or Aquaplex membership numbers, et cetera. But we are trying to streamline our the reports and the uh, our efficiencies and the work that we're doing to be to not have as many reports due on a regular basis. We it was getting a little cumbersome to manage. So that's the intent. But glad that you're liking. Yeah, I, I think the format is great and the content as always uh, outstanding. Just yeah, all around, all around nicely done and very happy to see about the membership uh, uh, drive in uh, August and yeah, just great, great work. Uh, any other commissioners with any questions or anything from those, uh, those reports that we want to pull out and discuss briefly? Seeing the hands. <laughs> oh, that is one thing before you leave. Um, That's so, true. Commissioner Parsons, for those that might not have heard him, just mentioned that there was very little graffiti. <laughs> um, I think those vandalism reports are kind of winding down. Not. Um, I, I think our vandalism is still happening, but staff has gotten more routine. I think at taking care of it. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll be frank, I'm going to try to wean this commission off of the vandalism report. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that it, um, it, it's something that we deal with just like anything else though, that we don't tell you about broken trees or broken benches or broken playground structures or, you know, it was a very specific focus, um, certainly important for us to track and we can provide that information if there's something substantial that we really need to know about. But it doesn't necessarily inform the decisions of this commission or your yeah. recommendations to the council. So we're going to keep you off of it. <laughs> I, lo I love that idea, Rebecca. I'm just going to put myself in there. I, I love that idea. It's it's always been a joy of entertainment for myself on this commission, seeing what weird things that weird that people do on city property. Um, it's been fun, but I, I completely agree with you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. I will say that I sent that uh, report to our maintenance staff a couple times just because I liked it so much and I was curious what the what it's like at the county, but uh, I understand if it's uh, unnecessary for our, you know, I haven't really weighed in on it. You're right, you know, we don't really weigh in on anything um, related to it, but it is, it is a great report and it's really cool that you guys have that. And so bravo for that. And uh, I, I think we'll be fine without it though. We'll continue maintaining the report, and if you have a desire to see it, we we can certainly send it out. Oh, well, thank you. Best of both worlds right there. All right, uh, any informational items to and from commissioners and staff? Uh, Commissioner Martin's hands up, go ahead. So I would, um, I'm just going to be try to be brief and and respect of your time, but I've been um, asked to be part of the commissioner salaries, um, the commission on decisions on um, council salaries. I've we, I've became chair on that commission and I've dutifully served that commission, and we have hopefully concluded the commission. Um, as of this month, we had four meetings in total, and we have come to a different conclusion and make a recommendation to um, to City Council. I hearkened if you have an opinion or want to have an opinion that you please voice it at, city, at the next City Council meeting when that comes up. I don't have a confirmed date when that is, but we're hoping to have this affect the, the, the people who are appointed on December the 20th, so hopefully 
it should be tomorrow, but hopefully that, that it comes up tomorrow, it comes up. Um, but we have made a decision. I hearken you to please look into it and voice your opinion. Um, and I just wanted to give you an update that that should be concluding um, if, if fingers crossed. But I just want to let you guys know. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Martin. That was specifically representing this commission on that commission. So thank you very much for taking that on. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Martin, um, and, and for chairing that committee and, and uh, reporting back to us. And uh, really glad to hear that you know, the work was hopefully successful and completed. Anything else uh, before we adjourn this here uh, Parks and Rec Commission meeting? I, I have a question, maybe it was at the last meeting, but I saw that there was a job posted of potentially recreation manager. Uh, did you guys fill that position? Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness, I totally forgot. Cause it's been a minute. Um, so we did post a new position for assistant parks and recreation directors. So that's a little bit different than our uh, recreation manager or parks manager positions. It would oversee both of those directly. And um, in terms of reporting structure reports to me, this new assistant and Amy Hagen applied for and uh, overwhelmingly um, was the consensus and has accepted that position. So she is now promoted to Assistant Parks and Recreation Director. Congratulations, Amy. That's really exciting. I uh, love when we can uh, move people up internally and uh, just I, you've been just such a, a standout employee and, and coworker and so glad to, to hear that. So congratulations to you and congratulations to the whole Parks and Rec Department. You guys got a good one there. So. Nicely done, and I'm happy to hear that. Um, Commissioner Martin has his hand up too. Congratulations, well deserved and well earned. You should be very proud of yourself. Thank, thank you so much for all the time you do. And that was that was my question. I was wondering how the budget process of the of of the whatever it's called of the parks and departments reorganization went through. So it sounds like that went through. So congratulations and I'm glad you're here to stay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So yeah, I mean, what it will do is create two vacancies. So we will have some upcoming recruitments for parks manager and recreation manager that you were uh, referencing Chair Conway. And we currently have a recruitment out available now for administrative specialists because the one, the only Beth Thomas has also been technically promoted to she is our events and marketing coordinator working with Haley Reynolds on our events team. <laughs> Thank Congrats. you, Amy. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'm so excited to serve pros in a different way. <laughs> Yeah, there will be some upcoming improvements, so by all means, we'll keep you, uh, the commission posted on that too, because we'll, with that, you know, once those recruitments are filled, we'll see some new faces, I think, to assisting with the commission with both the parks manager and recreation manager roles, as those two roles will be heavily focused on daily operations, but uh, still an integral part to delivering anything that is pros related. That would be neat to get the full team filled out. So that Amy doesn't have to do three jobs. <laughs> I'm sure Amy is doing those three jobs. I'm surprised you guys, you know what? Why not just put, keep it, keep them, you know, put Marge of all and Amy will just take care of it all. I think that's, that's probably a better way of doing it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm really excited. Congratulations to everyone. Um, what a what a wonderful way to uh, wrap up the meeting with some great news about the uh, pros department and um, like, like you know, uh, Commissioner Martin said, keep uh, keeping Amy and and retaining her uh, and promoting within is is always great. So just yeah, congrats all around. Looking forward to some new faces and looking forward to working with uh, you guys in different capacities. This is a uh, wonderful. Wonderful way to wrap up the uh, October Parks and Rec Commission meeting. Um, anything else before we adjourn? 
Well, great. Then uh, I will for sure see you guys on the 21st of November. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Have a great you. day, you Bye -bye. guys. Have a good month. Have a good night. It was cold. Yeah, it was really cold. Mm -hmm.